hello everyone. Welcome to the very first ever Wagon Train online class. Um, thanks for joining me. I assure you that the information that I'm going to share with you in this class will be the most valuable information that you will get in any dog training program. Uh, our goal is to understand how do dogs learn, how do they perceive what it is that we do, and how our behavior impacts their behavior. And basically, with the information that I'm giving you, you will be able to stop unwanted behaviors and you'll be able to encourage behaviors that you want. And ultimately, your dog is going to learn the difference between good decisions and bad decisions. So let's get started. Um, we'll start talking about a little bit about the vocabulary. So for the purpose of this session, I want you to understand that when I say positive, I am not referring to it meaning happy. I am referring to it as an adding something. So like math, positive would mean we're adding something and negative doesn't mean bad. It means that we're subtracting something. Okay. So positive is not happy. Positive is adding. Negative is not bad. It's just taking something away. So let's first start with, you know, the new buzz in dog training. Everybody's talking about positive reinforcement. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we're adding a reinforcement. It doesn't necessarily mean positive happy. It just means that you're adding a reinforcement. That's all that that means. Negative reinforcement would mean you are taking something away, okay? We also have, in addition to two types of reinforcements, we also have two types of punishment. So positive punishment, that doesn't mean happy punishment. It means that you are adding something. And what would that be? Well, that could mean a smack. It could mean that you've scruffed your dog. It could mean that you're choking them with a choke chain. And that is all stuff that I find personally unacceptable. And you won't find that in our program because it's not necessary. Um, what is negative punishment? Well, negative would mean that we're taking something away. And funny enough, whenever I ask my clients, oh, I have to punish you, but you get a choice. Do you want to be positively punished or do you want to be negatively punished? And when we have a show of hands, the majority of people put up their hand and say, I want to be positively punished. What does that mean for them? It means that, say, every single one of them got an electric shock in their chair. We added something to punish them. Those that said negative punishment, it meant that we took something away. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we go along. So let's talk about what it is that we want to communicate to our dogs. And in our society, and believe me, I've traveled all over the world studying canine culture and behavior. And when we look at our culture here, it's really hard in our society to say, yes, I like that, or to give a compliment. And for some, it's even hard to receive the compliment. So we need to change that up because with our dogs, it's really important that we point out what we like versus only focusing in on what we don't like, which is what most people do. So what is it that you like? What behaviors do you want to see repeated? Well, I think that a calm and relaxed behavior means great mental health and it means a dog that is open to learning and it means a dog that's easy to live with. So by default, this is always what I wanna see, is calm and relaxed behavior, calm and quiet. Unfortunately for the dogs, when they're calm and quiet, they get ignored. So an example of that would be, you know, some people come to your house, your dog is super excited, maybe he's jumping up, barking, panting heavily, nudging people, whatever. And, you know, he gets contact. People are pushing him, you know, no, stay down, get off. Um, people are making eye contact with the dog. They're talking to the dog. The dog is getting so much attention for the very behavior that you don't want. But when he finally goes and lays down and is quiet and settled, what happens? He gets ignored. Well, let's look at that a little bit more closely. If we only say, no, don't do that, all the dog might learn and will learn through repetition, but I prefer the dog's education be a lot more quick and more efficient than that. Um, but if we just say no, we're not actually educating the dog to what do we want them to do. 
Well, what do we want them to do? Well, we want them to be quiet and settled. We want them to know how to make good choices. And we, we want a nice, easy life with our dogs. So let's take some behavior examples. Let's say, for example, the dog is grabbing my pant leg and he's trying to shred my pant leg and he thinks that's really a lot of fun. If I just say no or stop it, what does the dog learn? Well, he might learn that he shouldn't grab my pant leg and try to shred, shred it. He might learn that through repetition. And if, you know, if I get mad enough, then he's gonna learn that, yeah, probably he shouldn't do that. But does he know what is the right behavior? Nope, doesn't know. So let's say then he's figured it out. I shouldn't shred her pant leg. Hmm. Maybe I should hump her leg. That would be fun. No, that's obviously a no. But again, if I only say no, does the dog know what to do? Not really. He's only learning sort of what not to do and he keeps picking the wrong thing. Now, let's take a third example. And believe me, this has happened and I see it happening in doggy daycare. The dog decides to pee on my leg. Is that a yes or a no? Clearly, that's a no, not acceptable. And remember that positive style of training shouldn't mean permissive, okay? And that seems to be a big problem that's growing is that people perceive that positive training means that everything is permissible. Just ignore what you don't want and reward what you do want. Well, that's a heavily flawed system, let me tell you. So positive shouldn't mean permissive, okay? So it's not acceptable, it's not permissible that the dog shred my pant leg, hump my leg, or pee on my leg, right? We don't accept any of those three things. But what is the right thing to do? The dog still has no idea. Well, wouldn't it go quicker if we just taught them what is the right thing to do? What is the right behavior to do when you're, when you're amongst my legs? That would be so much quicker and so much less stressful. Think about how if you were in a foreign country and you didn't understand the language at all, and you kept trying things and you just, you have no idea what they're saying and you're trying to do what they're telling you to do, but you don't understand anything that they're saying. Your anxiety will go up, your stress will go up, your education, it stays the same. You don't know. Maybe you've tried a hundred wrong things before you finally got the right thing. Well, how does that set us up for learning? It means that we get really frustrated and Actually, aggression um, often stems from frustration, okay? So keep that in mind. Well, what should we do? So we've got a dog that has no idea how to behave and we're always telling them no, no, no. But let's say the dog came over by my leg and sat really nice and quiet and was just looking up at me really quiet. Is that something that's desirable? Is that something that's acceptable? Yes, it is. So let's let them know when they're doing the right thing. Let's stop ignoring them when they are doing the right thing versus the wrong thing. So when my dog is quiet and settled, if my company has come over and my dog is finally gone and lied off down to the side and he's not bothering anybody, he's really quiet and calm, that's what we should be rewarding. That's what we should be reinforcing. We should be letting the dog know, yes, I like that. Yes, please do that again. The principles of behavior are really this simple. Any behavior that gets reinforced, rewarded, gets repeated, okay? So we have the three R's. We've got a reinforcement, which is rewarding, and it gets repeated. The next stage to that is any behavior that is being rewarded or reinforced, it gets stronger as it's being repeated. Behaviors being repeated get stronger. So how do some of our basic behaviors get stronger? 
Well, your recall, for example, calling your dog. It's one of the most important skills you will teach your dog. Could save its life one day. When we call the dog, that behavior can get stronger because the dog will come quicker. The dog will come faster. The dog will do something nicely at your feet, like come into a really nice sit, won't put a foot on you, won't bark at you. Everything can be polished and the behavior gets stronger and stronger and stronger. That's a good thing. Now, sometimes we have these lists that we're going to give, especially the puppy people, where we're going to instruct you not to teach them. Don't teach them these certain behaviors, okay? For example, shake a paw is one of them. We don't recommend that you train puppies to shake a paw. Why? Because what they learn first, they learn best. And what we want them to learn the best is to keep their feet on the floor, okay? We want them to learn to be quiet and settled, to come when they're called, when they're called. We want them to sit. We want them to stand still. We want them to lie down. We don't want them throwing their feet at us. We don't want them jumping at us. We don't want to do things that are rewarding them to be doing this. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so let's remember we should focus on behaviors that we want. And remember that behaviors that we don't want are not always permissible, okay? If a dog is jumping on you and jumping on you and jumping on you, and all you do is turn your back, well, all he's doing is jumping on your back, okay? It's still rewarding for the dog. Now we can back up a little bit. Why do dogs want to jump up? Well, humans teach them that, and it all starts when they're this itty bitty puppy. And they're holding the puppy, because you know, it'll fit in the palm of your hands, no matter what breed of dog, at one point it fit in somebody's hands. And what do you do? You hold it all close, right near your face and immediately the puppy learns one of the very first things is this is a super interesting place to be your mouth has amazing uh, number of odors coming out of them which you might find offensive but maybe not but the dogs sure like it and usually their first contact with people is up close and it's around the face and what they learn first they learn best so they want to be up here this is really where they want to be so we've got to teach them ah it's more rewarding to keep your feet on the floor okay now i can help you teach your dog to keep its feet on the floor i can train dogs to do a million things i can't train your friends and your company and the delivery guy, I can't, I can't train any of those people. So it's really important. If you have people coming over and you know that they're that type that, you know, encourages the dog, they're like, oh, jump on me, jump on me. Oh, it's okay, I love dogs. That's somebody that you need to be prepared for. And how are we going to be prepared for them? We are going to make sure our dog is put away when they're coming over. It's really important because the dog jumping up on them is so rewarding and it can be so reinforcing to them that they find it really exciting and enjoyable and they want to do it. So don't let people undo your good training, okay? Really important. I believe that in dogs that are really excitable, they should always be put away when people are coming over for at least 15 minutes because that way they don't build that anxiety. And when somebody comes in, if the dog is put away, not to punish them, put them away with something that they enjoy. And you're gonna hear me talk about stuffed Kongs quite a bit. Put them away. When your company arrives, let everybody get settled. Don't have your dog at the door risking any of these bad behaviors being reinforced. Have the dog away in a crate, give them a stuffed Kong or something they really enjoy. Bring your company in, get everybody settled, and then very quietly, let your dog out. And that reward is also that the dog is coming out of the crate when it's quiet and settled. The reward is freedom. So usually by then, the excitement is worn off. It's not a big deal. Usually your company is seated by that point. And um, if you have to, you know, put up a barrier. In, in my home, 
I have a sunken living room. I have a baby gate up on the stairs. And I actually don't want my dogs in the living room because it's a, I have a lot of Goldens and that's a lot of dog hair. And I would just rather have one room that I don't have to clean and vacuum every day. But that's it. Keep in mind, when your dog comes up, you need to be aware of the behaviors that you want and you don't want, okay? So when your dog is lying down and is quiet and settled, please do quietly, quietly, not all excited. We wanna keep them calm. So have something great that's a treat. Go over and present it to your dog, okay? We're going to give them a reward marker, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. We're gonna let them know that is the right behavior. That is the thing I want you to do. And here's your reward. The reward reinforces the behavior. Any behavior getting reinforced gets repeated, right? So what's the dog learning? Good things happen when I'm quiet and settled and I'm over there. Those things don't happen when I'm mauling the company or I have my hat on their lap and I'm drooling all over them or I'm nudging their arm to pet me and all of these things, as long as people are not giving in to those behaviors. So be really careful about inadvertently rewarding the wrong behavior. Be very aware of that, okay? It's very hard for people not to look over at their dog when they're barking or they're being rambunctious or whatever. It's very, very, very challenging not to acknowledge them when that's going on. So I want you to make sure that you're not doing that, okay? Everything is like a scale, okay? And it's kind of almost even a paycheck if you think about this. Um, let's say that there's one job that you have and this person is going to pay you, say, $20 for that job. This person is going to pay you $40 for that job. It's the exact same job. The environment is pretty much equal. Who are you going to work for? I think you're going to do it for the 40 bucks. So my son also has a really good analogy. He says, if you give a child the option to choose one of two things, one is a jigsaw puzzle, one is a video game, which one are they going to pick? Most kids are picking the video game. So what's more exciting? You have to learn to be exciting to your dog. You have to learn to be motivational to your dog. You have to work on those skills and you have to make sure that you're doing this in your day-to-day -day lives. Throughout this training program, there is not a lot of formal homework where you're going aside and you're doing formal exercises. This is all about what we do in our daily lives because every moment, every moment that you spend with your dog, you are teaching your dog something. So let's make sure that the something is something worth repeating that you like. Rather than focusing in on what you don't like, we're really going to focus in on what we do like because when we keep rewarding those behaviors and we keep acknowledging the dog for making those right decisions, your dog is going to do it more and more and more and more and more. And that's what we want, right? So let's get started on the next phase. All right, so we have to understand what is positive reinforcement? Well, that means that we are going to add a reinforcement to a behavior. So let's say that the dog looks at us when we say its name. We are going to reinforce that behavior by giving them a treat. And eye contact is important, right? If we can get the dog's attention, we can communicate better with them. If the dog is sitting nicely, we are going to reward that sit, and then that sit gets repeated. We're going to be adding to these behaviors. Positive reinforcement, we're adding to it to get it to be repeated. Negative reinforcement, it's important that we understand what that is. So negative reinforcement, a really good example of that would be say a choke chain. Now, I don't condone the use of choke chains. Um, I find them acceptable in cases of, let's say a mastiff, where the neck is bigger than the head. And if you don't have a collar that can tighten, 
if it's just a regular flat collar and a dog has anatomy like that, the collar will slip off the head. And that can be a dangerous situation when you're out walking, right? So in those cases, martingales and choke chains, I do find acceptable. But let's talk about the typical use of the choke chain. So we called it the jerk and pull method, and it was how all dog training was done years ago. And some facilities are still doing it that way. We want to understand what actually happens with that. Choke chain type training means that when the dog is pulling, the chain is choking the dog, okay? So it's putting pressure on their trachea and it's making them uncomfortable. When the dog stops pulling, then the choke is released. That's a negative reinforcement. That means you've taken away the reinforcement. So through that method, you would be trying to teach the dog not to pull on the leash. And when they stop pulling on the leash, then you would take away the negative part of the reinforcement. The reinforcement is the choking. The negative is that you've taken it away. And when you've taken away the choking, then the dog would hopefully learn through repetition that if he pulls, he gets choked. If he doesn't pull, he doesn't get choked. Now let's think about this. Who do you want to work for? Somebody that's choking you or somebody that's giving you really great things? Well, I know who I want to work for. I wouldn't want to work for the one that was choking me. I would prefer to work for the one that is rewarding me. I think you'll agree. So when we have positive reinforcement, that is the basis for this program. We're not utilizing negative reinforcement. And we also need to talk about the treats. The treats should not be bribery. When is it bribery? When it's presented first. A great example, so I was visiting a friend and she let her dog out in her fenced backyard and he was having a heyday out there. He was, you know, sniffing and playing with sticks and eating rabbit poop and all that stuff. And she wanted him to come in, but he didn't want to come in. He is like, no, I'm busy. He's blowing her off and she's calling him again and again and again and again. Well, basically what she's teaching him is that by the recall, she's extinguishing that behavior entirely because she's repeating it. So what does the dog learn? He learns that, hey, when she says, Rover, come, she doesn't mean it. It means nothing. I am just going to continue eating my rabbit poo and sniffing and eating sticks and running around the yard. And I'm going to ignore her because it means nothing. That's what you're teaching them when you're repeating commands. So it's very important that you don't repeat anything. So I sat quietly. She wasn't asking me for my advice. So I just kept my lips closed. And what did she do? Well, she grabbed a bag of treats and she started shaking it and she's like, Rover, cookies. <sighs> well, yep, he came like lightning. Now she's taught him, go ahead and ignore me and I'll get rewarded because I'll ignore her and then she'll bring out the cookies. That's not what we want with our dogs, is it? I don't think it is because what happens when we don't have any cookies? What happens in that point? Well, then we have a dog that doesn't listen to us, right? It's just like if you said to your child, you know, go clean your room and they didn't clean the room. And then you said, if you clean your room, I'll give you a chocolate bar. And then they went and cleaned the room. That's bribery. The next time you want them to clean their room, if you don't have a chocolate bar, you're out of luck. Maybe you'll get them to clean their room out of uh, positive punishment. Maybe you're threatening them. I don't know. But Without the chocolate bar, you don't have a lot of luck. Wouldn't it be better if your child cleaned the room and you acknowledged it and then you rewarded it, but they didn't know that the reward even existed? Well, I think that would be a really, really nice surprise for them. So with our dogs, we wanna make sure that we're not bribing them, okay? Do not present the reward first. So basic learning, it's the same in you know, with, it's not just dogs, okay? It's, it's, um, it's horses, it's tigers, it's elephants. Yes, I've trained them. It's husbands, it's children, it's, it's even tarantula spiders. They all learn the same. We have opera conditioning and we have classical conditioning. I really like it when I can educate an animal utilizing operant conditioning. You're probably wondering, what does that mean? 
Well, what it means is we have three steps. So we have a behavior that happens on its own. We didn't set it up. We didn't ask for it. We didn't manipulate it. It just happens. Well, what do you mean it just happens? Well, all dogs sit and lie down and can make eye contact with you um, and can end up on you, at your side when you're walking. All dogs can do that on their own. The difference is that they know when we expect it of them or they do it in response to our requesting it of them. Okay, so when the dog is sitting by his choice, he came up with that on his own. You should reward it. It's just like when I was saying earlier about how when your company comes over and your dog is finally quiet and settled and you got up and you went and rewarded them for that, that is operant condition. The behavior came first. I want to add that when you acknowledge your dog for being quiet and settled and you go over and give him a treat, the dog is going to break the behavior and follow you back looking for more treats. That is so important. It's a pivotal moment. Don't reward your dog. Don't look at him. Don't talk to him. And don't direct his behavior to go lie back down. Let him make the choice and then reward it again. Okay, so the three steps. The behavior happens, you reward it, and then you'll add the cue to it. So let's say in the case of lying down, the behavior just happened. The dog went and lied down and is settled on its own. You're going to get the treat. You're going to go over and reward it. That's step two. And step three, you're going to attach the verbal cue, which would be logically lie down. Through that repetition of that verbal cue word, your dog will understand and associate the cue with the behavior. Also in the dog's brain, they're thinking, good things happen when I do these behaviors. So that's where we want their head at. We don't want dogs that are behaving out of an aversion of punishment. Years ago, I was a choke chain trainer. I, it breaks my heart when I think about it now. Um, but I had dogs that were brilliant, so they appeared. Their obedience was super tight. They didn't do any mistakes. What was the difference? Well, I'll give you an example. If my dog was in a downstay and he broke from the downstay, I would grab him by the scruff and I would drag him back and I'd plant him down and I'd yell at him. So why did he keep the downstay? Well, he kept it out of an aversion of this punishment. That's not a great relationship to have. And I'm proud to say that I don't train that way anymore because I've learned a lot since then. So now why do my dogs maintain a downstay? Well, because they want to. They're motivated to hold that position. They're motivated to offer that behavior. That's a better relationship all around. And when I look back to videos, I used to do these demonstrations at the Sportsman Show in Toronto. And yeah, my dogs, people thought they were so impressive. Now I kind of cringe when I look at the videos and I think, oh my dear Lord, my dog looks so stressed. And now I look at my dogs and they're so happy. They have a relaxed face and they're really happy. So I like the results that I'm getting now. For me, it was a real pivotal point when I had the honor and the privilege of working with elephants. And if you think about it, I couldn't throw a choke chain on an elephant and jerk and pull it with a leash. And I couldn't grab it by the collar and push its bum down and make it sit. Um, on the same token, I couldn't grab it by the front of the collar and push on its shoulders and force it down. Um, physically impossible. <laughs> uh, I also, I never used a turkey stick or cattle prod or anything like that. Um, it was simple. It was jelly beans. Jelly beans. Yes, jelly beans. What, what do I mean by that? It's simple. All of those behaviors that we needed were happening naturally. And the elephants understood that when they did certain behaviors, they got a jelly bean. And so they started repeating these behaviors. So if I can have an elephant walk at my side through thousands of people and sit and lie down and do all of these other behaviors on request and also know when it's appropriate to do what, why can't you train a dog without using physical punishment or negative reinforcement, right? 
So let's get back to dogs, shall we? The dogs will learn rapidly this way. It just takes some patience on your part in the beginning. In the beginning, waiting for behaviors can be a little bit frustrating. It will come quicker because you will start to see that the wheels will be turning in the dog's mind. They'll always be thinking, hmm, what, what should I do? What should I do? What should I do next? And you'll, you'll actually see them get really excited. And to them, it's almost going to be like a game. Like they're going to be having so many thoughts going through their head, trying to figure out what should I do next? And that's a really good place to be. But it's also very important that we recognize when we want them to just be still. So if we were teaching a downstay, we want the dog to understand, no, I want you to hold that behavior. I'm not waiting for something else to come out. I'm not waiting for you to do something else. I want you to hold that behavior. So keep that in mind as we're going along. And I'm going to help you fine tune that as we go. But that's just one of the things that can kind of get detoured off and go astray in the training if we allow it. But we're not going to allow it, right? We're going to be on top of this. So let's get back to our dogs. And what are we going to do with them? Well, one of the first things that people formally train their dogs to do is sit. So when we start talking about sitting, I want you to not be bored and not hit fast forward on a video or skip across it. I want you to understand this one thing. That is often a default behavior that should come easily. Some dogs, not so much, but most dogs, it'll come very easily. And what I want you to do is I only want you to wait for it. Only wait for the sit. Don't tell them to sit. Don't tell them. Okay. And don't pop on the leash and don't snap your fingers or do any hand signals or whatever it is that you do to try to get it. In the beginning, we're trying to get the dog to understand that we want them to think and we want them to offer, offer the behavior and learn that good things happen when they make good choices, okay? That connection is paramount to the success of this program. Now, let's get back to dogs learning. Well, how do they learn? Well, there was this guy Pavlov, and his name might ring a bell, but just to sum up his work in a nutshell, he had a dog, a dinner bell, and a bowl of food, and he paired the dinner bell with the food. So what happened in the dog's brain? This association occurred that when he heard the bell, he knew his food was coming. How do we know that? Well, Pavlov proved that because the dog started to salivate with only the dinner bell, the food he removed after he got that response from the dog. Pretty cool, right? So even though there was no food, when he was ringing the dinner bell, it had been paired and associated so strongly with that bowl of food that the dog realized, oh, okay. And in the brain, the little wires came together and connected the bell and the food together. So take away the food, just rang the bell, the dog salivated. And that was all the proof that we needed that this works. So we want to make a conditioned response in our dogs. And if you've ever heard of clicker training, well, we're going to talk about that next. And why I don't use clicker training in the classroom, but why I do use clicker training in other instances. So we're going to come up with that next. Okay, so let's talk about clicker training. If you've never heard of clicker training, clicker training is basically where you're using a clicker. These are both the same. Uh, so it's a little plastic box. It has an aluminum tab inside of it. And you would just take your thumb and it makes a click noise. Okay. So one of the reasons why we don't use this in class is because they all sound the same. And if there's six or more dogs in the class, even if there's two or more dogs in the class, it can be really confusing and it could end up sounding like that, which will defeat the whole purpose of this. The other reason why I don't typically use the clicker is because what if you don't have it? What if it breaks? What if it's 20 below zero and you're walking your dog and your dog's healing beautifully and you want to click to let them know that's the right thing to do? Are you going to take off your mitt to do the click? I know I'm not. And 20 below, it'll probably break anyways. So I would rather use um, a reward marker that is my voice. And 
I just simply say yes. I don't say good. Good, I do say good, but I don't say good as a reward marker. And the reason being is that we've mostly taught our dogs already. We've already had that vocabulary with them. And typically when we say good, it usually means a release. So the dog hears good and then he knows that you're probably getting the cookies out and so he breaks the behavior and he's coming to get the cookie. So we need to train you. Um, all of us need to learn how to stop saying no, I don't like that, and saying yes, I like that. And that's going to take a little bit of discipline and it's going to be a bit of a challenge for us. But I know you can do it. So. If you want to use the clicker and you're, you're by yourself and you're training, by all means do. But my preference is to say yes. You always have your voice. It's always there. It's always with you. It sounds different than everybody else. Okay. Um, and I find it's much better um, to use the voice than it is the clicker. In addition to that, the clicker, a bag of treats and your leash. That can be way too much for some people to, to manage and um, studying class people over a number of years it turns out that less than 20 percent actually not much more than 15 percent have the timing and the coordination to deal with a clicker a bag of treats and a leash so i want you to be successful so we're going to put these away we're not going to use these now you're probably wondering what is a reward marker well that will be your first homework so i'm going to show you the homework and it's going to start with conditioning your dog to the reward marker. And let's just take a look and see how that is. But before we get started, you need to prepare. So you need to have your treats ready. You need to have 85 treats. Yep, 85. That sounds like a lot. Well, it can be, but we need to make sure the size is small. Now, when we're talking about treats, I'm talking about treats, right? If I gave you a piece of kale, is that a treat? Eh, not really. If I gave you a brownie, hmm, that might be a treat, right? So think about the same way. Now, you know, if you have a lab, everything is a treat. Anything that's edible is a treat. So um, <laughs> let's focus more on the fact that the size should be small. And when I say small, I'm talking about if you took a Cheerio and you broke it in half, and you even broke it in half again, that's how small we're talking. So count out 85 pieces ahead of time. Treat-wise, what do I prefer? I don't get any kickback from this company, but this is usually what I use. Uh, there's lots of liver products out on the market. The reason why I like Benny Bullies over the other ones for training is that they come in these wonderful, wafers that are easily broken into tiny pieces and because they're all in wafers they all break very very easily so that's why i prefer this brand over the other brand now there's others and they can be get pretty chunky and they're very difficult to break into small pieces those ones are less expensive and I do have a use for them, and typically that is going into the stuffed Kongs, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But um, get your 85 treats ready, and you can have a training pouch, or you can put it in your pocket, or whatever is going to be easy for you to get it in and out. The reason why it's 85 is because science has shown us that 85 is the number of repetitions to make it stick in their head, okay? So give or take, but still. Now, I think everybody in the household should do this exercise, but don't split it between two people. So it's not like I should do 40 and you should do 45. No, I'm gonna do all 85. If you wanna do 85, you can too. And we can do this several times a day. What we are going to be doing is we are going to be conditioning the dog to realizing that when he hears the word, yes, something good is coming. Okay, so you're gonna have 85 treats and you're gonna pre-count them so that you're not trying to count as you go. And this exercise should take you less than two minutes. If it takes you more than that, you're doing it wrong. Our rate of reinforcement has to be fast. So it's boom, boom, boom. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like soon. And when you do this, 
Your dog will be in front of you. It doesn't matter if he's sitting, lying down, or standing. If your dog starts jumping on you or barking at you, you're not fast enough in delivering the treats. So here's a typical example of what happens when your rate of reinforcement is not fast enough or you're not prepared. So some people decide to take a shortcut, so I'm just demonstrating that here. I don't have my 85 treats prepared in advance. I'm just going to be handing them and breaking them as we go. And you can see that I can't get the size proper for this tiny puppy. It takes her too long to eat them. And as well, it takes me too long to prepare and dish the treat out to my puppy. So she starts to climb on me, and that's not the behaviors that we wanna be rewarding. We need a very quick rate of reinforcement so that it's yes treat, yes treat, yes treat, yes treat. The size of the treat has to be small enough for the dog to be able to consume it very quickly so that you can get the next one dished out in time. Also, if you drop the treat, don't draw your dog's attention to it. Just keep going with your session of yes treat, yes treat. Even if the treat is sitting on the floor, if your dog is looking for it and finds it, that's great but just resume right away and keep going. So you can see here, she's looking and she's found some, excuse me, crumbs on the floor and she's going for it, but that is interrupting the flow of what I'm doing here. So if your dog is looking for the treat on the floor, I want you to interrupt them and just say, yes, treat, yes, treat, yes, treat. And I'm not actually saying the word treat, but you're giving the treat. And when your rate of reinforcement is fast, you're going to get a different response. So I'll show you that in the next clip with another dog. By the way, this is a puppy. Um, she's only eight weeks old. She's a purebred Corgi, and this is her very first conditioning session. Okay, so to start with, it's not about the position of the dog. We're just simply yes, treat, yes, treat, yes, treat, yes, treat, 85 times. And you're literally going to look like that one after another. Okay, we want the treats to be tiny so that they can eat them quickly so that we can get the next reinforcement into them, the next reward into them as quickly as we can. Some people ask, can I use my dog's kibble as a treat? I would prefer not. And while you might have a chocolate lab that thinks kibble is the greatest thing in the world, it takes too long to chew and it's very difficult to break it into tiny pieces. So I prefer things that I can make small and things that are very high value. And dehydrated liver is, in my experience, very high value for the dogs. I also use wieners and I chop them up and um, so I'll slice them and quarter them. 
and you can even put them in the microwave for a few seconds just to make them a little bit more rubbery. A mixture of treats works really well. So if you have different things you can combine in there, even Cheerios. Get the Cheerios mixed in with some of the Benny Bullies powder. Um, you can grind this up into a powder really easily, and now you have an extension of liver trees. But um, a trail mix type bag works really well in case they lose interest. But for the purpose of this exercise, you can just stick with one. They're gonna want you to keep going. And because they're so little and your reinforcement so quickly, um, I don't think they're gonna snub their nose at it. Now, that said, poodles and German Shepherds can be anorexic until they are like eight years old. So don't be surprised if you have one of those two breeds and they're not that keen on treats. You're going to have to find something really super high value. You might even have to have your dog a little bit hungry at the time that you start, but you're gonna make it exciting for them as well, okay? Um, we also will be using toys and things like that to motivate and reward our dogs, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So right now, this is about conditioning the reward marker. And we're going to do that over the course of the week. And we wanna make sure that our dogs have made this association between the word yes and the treat, okay? So when they hear yes, they know in their brain that this is coming. They know something good is coming, right? Just like Pavlov associated the bell and the dinner bell. So this isn't, this isn't about food. This is about a reward. It's important to note, all right? So we're gonna repeat that exercise as many times as we can over the next week. Yes, 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 yes. After your dog is clearly conditioned to the reward marker, which is the word yes, then you can start to add criteria. So you saw me throw the treat away and I'm not going to direct my dog's behavior. I want to see what he's going to offer me. He's obviously engaged and yes, I did direct him there. I wanted him to come in, um, but for the most part in this exercise, we're waiting for the behavior. Are we, are we waiting for them to hold the sit? And if so, it should only be for one second. Don't expect more. Criteria has to be really low. Here I'm moving away. I wanna see what he offers me. If it's something that I like, I would reward it. It's something that I don't like, I'm not gonna bother. I'm not gonna say no, but I'm just not gonna dish the treat out. I'll throw the treats off to the side sometimes, which will encourage him to break the behavior. What I'm looking for is for him to make the right choice to return to in front of me in preferably a sit or a down position. So there I did cue him up to move him in, but again, this is a dog that um, is a little bit more further advanced. So this is what you're gonna be working towards, but in the first week, all I want you to do is condition them to the reward marker so that when they hear the word yes, they know something good is coming, and then you can start to add a criteria where you're actually expecting them usually to sit. That would be a great starting point. And remember, if you're expecting a sit stay, if you ask for more than one second, you're going to confuse the dog and he'll break and not understand. Now, what you might see is that your dog is gonna to start to figure this out. He's gonna to start to be aware of when you're prepping to do this and he's gonna get excited. And maybe by the third day that you're doing this, cause you should do this every day. I, I know that you have two minutes a day to dedicate to this, okay? Maybe even two minutes, three times a day. I'm sure you can fit that in. If you can start to realize that the dog knows that you say the word yes and something good is coming, I want you to start focusing in on a behavior, which is sit. So you would wait with your treats, and I'm going to demonstrate this. You're gonna wait with your treats, and when the dog sits, you're going to say yes, and you're going to say yes, 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 rewarding each time. Each time you say yes, you're going to reward. It's not always gonna be like this. We're not always gonna be having treats. It's in the learning phase. So we're gonna say yes, 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 yes. Maybe we say that five or six times while they're holding the sit. And then I want you to take a treat and throw it off to the side so that your dog breaks the sit, goes to get the treat, 
but you're going to stand like a tree. Don't move, don't hand signal, don't verbalize, don't fidget treats in your pocket with your hand, don't do anything, okay? I want your eyes on the bum, on the bum of the dog, not looking in the eyes, don't look him in the eyes. I want you to look at the dog's bum. So he'll go get the treat, he's gonna come back to you, and I want you to look at his bum and wait patiently and still for him to sit. And when he sits, what are you gonna say? Great, you're going to say yes, and you're going to reward that. Reward it a few more times, and then throw the treat off to the side again. He breaks it, he's gonna come back, let him sit. Now, I don't want you to keep throwing that treat off to the side because then he's gonna start to think that's part of the game. Then what I want you to do is reinforce the sit. You're rewarding the sit by treating him and saying yes. Reverse order, say yes and then treat. And then what I want you to do would be maybe just take a step back. Just take a step back away from your dog and see if he holds it or does he come to you. Whichever happens, I want you to stick with it. If he holds it, reward him and work on that sit stay. But don't get them all confused in the beginning, in the learning phase. Don't get them confused where sometimes you're going to reward him for following you and sitting and sometimes you're going to reward him for sitting and holding it. Pick one at a time. And if it's going to be the stay, then you're going to say sit, stay. And he gets rewarded for that. Please know this. Increments have to be very tiny. We only expect behavior for one second. Don't push it because if you're holding it out for three seconds or five seconds or whatever it is, your dog is going to start to think, I'm not getting rewarded. This isn't the right behavior. And then he's going to get very confused. And now you've got to back up and start over. We don't want you to do that. So let's hold it to one second. A one second sit is a one second sit stay one step apart, okay? If you have increased your criteria, my criteria is only one second. First, my criteria is just sitting. And then my criteria is sitting for one second. And as I'm bumping that up, let's say I go to five seconds and my dog breaks the behavior at four seconds. Well, I've asked for too much too soon, so I have to back down. I'd go back down to say two seconds and be reinforcing the two second stay, slowly building it to three, to four, to five, etc. I know that if you can get one second of a behavior, you can get an hour of this behavior, okay? One time I was driving a Winnebago around the United States and I had an Airedale Terrier and I was at a campground and I put her in a downstay while I was packing up my campsite. And she held the downstay and she was really good and very quiet. And I packed everything up and loaded up into the Winnebago and drove down the interstate. Well, after about three hours of driving, I saw a rest area and I thought, well, I really should pull over and let her out to go to the bathroom. Well, guess what? She was not in the Winnebago. I left her in the downstay. So I drive back three hours. So now we're gone for six. And where was she? She was still in the downstay. Remarkable? Yes. Sad? Yeah, I felt really bad. But what a good solid downstay she had. <laughs> so uh, needless to say, yeah, I had a lot of apologizing to do to my dog. But I want you to know it's a fine example of any behavior that gets rewarded, gets repeated and gets stronger. Okay, it gets stronger. What, uh, what kind of behaviors can get stronger that we have to kind of back off on? Well, I'll tell you a story, a couple stories. I had a Jack Russell Terrier. I had a few Jack Russell Terriers, but the last one I thought is so much energy and I thought make himself useful and I taught him to do different things. So he learned object discrimination, which meant that he could identify objects by name and he would go pick them up. So something simple, like if I sneezed, he'd run over automatically without being told and he would grab a Kleenex out of the box and bring it to me. Well, I also taught him to turn on and off light switches. Bad idea. 
How did that behavior get stronger? Well, he turned them on, turned them off, turned them on, turned them off, turned them on, turned them off, and the drywall was destroyed. And he was almost obsessive compulsive about it. So I had some untraining to do there. Um, but a better story is, is that years ago, I had adopted um, a golden retriever named that we named Stinky. And he was the greatest family dog ever, but I was his fourth home. And Stinky, he needed a job. And being a golden retriever, he should retrieve things, right? So living on a farm, my driveway is very long. And I thought a good job for him would be to go out and get me the paper on Saturday morning. Because I wasn't a fan of going out in my green rubber boots and my house coat going all the way down the driveway. So I would be making my tea and I'd say, Stinky, go get the paper. And I trained him to go down the driveway to fetch the paper and bring it back. It was great. How did the behavior get stronger? He came back faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. He was like lightning getting that paper. He was bolting out the door. He couldn't wait to go. Now, he didn't bolt until I told him he could go. I just want to add that in there. But one day, he wasn't quick. And I started to panic. And I thought the worst things. I thought, oh my gosh, what if the paper was in the middle of the road? What if he got hit by a car? What if, what if, what if? So I, in my house coat, put my green rubber boots on and I started to head um, towards the door to go outside to find my dog. And there he was. He had five newspapers, five. Do you know how far he had to go to get five newspapers? I live on a farm. <laughs> My nearest neighbor is 2,000 feet away. And the Saturday paper is thick. And this poor dog, he was probably so stressed out, dropping those papers and trying to pick them up and carry them all. I felt really bad. But um, then my phone started ringing and it was my neighbor saying, hey, did you get the paper? I'm like, nope. <laughs> I didn't lie because I, I denied getting a paper. I got five papers, but I wasn't gonna tell them that. I had to go and train my dog um, some parameters to that behavior so that he didn't leave my driveway. He didn't bring more than one paper. And that took a lot more time actually than teaching him to get one paper. So just another example of how behaviors get stronger. Um, and sometimes we don't intend them to. So anything outside of your basic behaviors, sit down, stand, stand stay, come when you're called. We want to make sure that we think about how this behavior could evolve or get stronger in a way that's not desirable and put parameters on it from the start. So getting a little bit off track there, but anyhow, operant conditioning, shaping behaviors, very, very powerful learning tools for your dog. Let's talk about punishment. We have two types of punishment. We have positive punishment where you're adding something, remember? not allowed, and negative punishment where we take something away. Well, in order to make negative punishment effective, we have to know what is of value to your dog. So let's think of things, let's make a list about things that are valuable to your dog. So what does your dog value? Let's think about that. Um, does your dog value treats? Sure. Does your dog value playing with toys? Probably. Um, probably more rewarding that the dog plays with you, um, your attention. There's all kinds of things that can be very rewarding for the dog. But one of the most rewarding is something called freedom. So freedom is a privilege that is earned by way of good behavior. No dog, in my opinion, should have freedom of the entire house um, as they're growing up. It's something that they should earn as they mature and their behaviors become more solid and more reliable. They are clean in the house and they're not going to destroy things and, and get into our plants and whatever. And as that behavior gets to be solidified and we can we know that it's reliable in our dogs, then their freedom in the house can expand. But the kind of freedom that I'm talking about is just general freedom. Um, it depends on the environment. So if you have a dog that's loose in the room, 
and he's not tethered or anything, then one could say that he's free. He can investigate any part of the room that he chooses. He can sniff there, sniff there. He can run around the room, whatever. He has his freedom in that room. But when we're talking about freedom, we're not necessarily talking about a dog that's you know, running through the meadows, chasing the butterflies. We're talking about whatever the context of the environment is at the time. So freedom is a really valuable um, training tool that is often just given away for free. Before I get into that a little bit more, I also want to point out that feeding your dog is also a really, really good training tool. And again, that's also something that is given away for free. So remember when I said that we don't have a lot of formal homework, that this is a program where we recognize that every interaction we have with our dog is teaching them something new? Why do dogs pull on a leash? Well, they pull on the leash because it's rewarding to them. Let's think about as puppies, it's two o'clock in the morning and they're crying and they're in the crate. I hope they're in the crate. Crate training is really important because just remember one day your dog might need to be confined in a hospital cage and you don't want it to be stressed out. Dogs that are crate trained are dogs that are calm and they're easy for people to dog sit and they're easy to transport and it makes their life so much less stressful, okay? We're gonna do a video about crate training though. But when we have the dog on the leash, and especially as puppies, when we take them out at say two o'clock in the morning to go potty, we start to think, oh, well, he's pulling me and I should go over there. I should, um, I'll probably have more success for him to go to the bathroom if I just follow him and let him take me wherever he wants to go. And what is the puppy learning really quickly, really young? Uh, I can pull my owner and I get to go where I want to go. So then they, you're going down the sidewalk if you live in the city and then they're pulling you here and here and here and they want to sniff there and they want to sniff that. And oh my goodness, now you've got a dog that's full size that's ready to pull you off your feet. And then you start to say, I don't like walking him anymore. Let's be proactive and prevent that from happening, shall we? So as a puppy, you need to make sure that you're taking them to one spot in the yard and one spot only. And we'll elaborate on this more in a house training video for the puppy people. But stick to your guns, stay in that one spot, put some of your puppy's poop there, or take some of the you know grass where they peed or whatever and put it there so that it's scented. You can also buy a pheromone spray. Um, a lot of the pet supply stores have something like that. And when you spray it on and it's kind of an attractant that they're going to want to go there and they're going to want to um, relieve themselves there more likely. But when you're there, don't keep interrupting them. Don't keep talking to them. OK, make sure that, you know, it's just a simple go potty and you're standing still and their perimeter is only around you. But we'll elaborate more on that in the house training video. So make sure you tune into that one, too. Um, but anyways, that's where pulling starts. So. I want to mention the opposite of pulling, which would be parking, and that's more of a new puppy issue than anything. But it's really important that if your puppy is parking and refusing to walk forward, that you don't pull on the leash. When you pull on the leash, you're putting pressure on the back of the neck, and you're only causing them to park harder because they'll counter that pressure. You need to get motivational. You need to be rewarding any forward movement, and it's up to you to make that leash loose, not your puppy. So go to your puppy so that you have a loose contact with the leash, and be very motivational and reward them for every step they take forward and be happy. Freedom. Freedom to go sniff what you want to sniff. Freedom to do whatever. That requires good behavior. The freedom is the reward. So let's say, for example, um, my dog stops pulling me and I know that he really wants to go sniff that hydro pole. The moment that he stops pulling me, I might even run to the hydro pole with him as a kind of a double whammy reward because that's super exciting and fun too. But if he keeps pulling me, I'll probably turn around and move further away from that pole. So it's kind of a bit of a punishment. Like I'm taking that pole away from you because you're pulling me. And when you stop pulling me, you'll get closer to it. Negative punishment. I'm taking the pole away from him. 
um, when we talk about freedom and how much of a great training tool that is, um, it ties into punishment, believe it or not. So one of the most effective forms of punishment, and let's talk about punishment. People don't want to talk about punishment, especially when they got a cute little puppy and they just can't even wrap their heads around punishing this sweet, cute little thing. But it is important because remember that your training, although it is going to be a good experience for your dog, there needs to be consequences for some behaviors. And those behaviors um, are usually ones that are self-rewarded. So you can't top them. One of them could be that your dog enjoys pulling so much that he doesn't care about the treat, okay? Um, not all dogs are like that. Some are though, but it's something to be aware of. Your dog needs to realize that he gets his freedom when he gives you the right behavior for one second, just one, and then we'll build on two and three and so on and so forth. When we have a behavior that we don't like, so let's say the dog is incessantly barking at you, it's attention getting behavior, and he's just barking at you and barking at you and barking at you, you're going to punish that behavior because it's rewarding himself um, you might even make the mistake of looking at your dog, making eye contact, or even saying, be quiet, which is also rewarding the behavior. You're inadvertently rewarding the very behavior you don't want, but that's not e enough to just take that away, okay? Just by not looking at him and not talking to him, that is not enough to curb that behavior. Why? Because maybe he likes the sound of his voice. Maybe he thinks in his head, oh, this is great. Like I'm, you know, I'm such a good talker. We can't allow that behavior to go on. It's not permissible. So there should be a consequence for that choice because that's the bad choice. That's the wrong choice. And we want him to learn from it. So here's what I suggest. Here's based on decades of experience of training dogs. This works very well. And we call it negative punishment. So what we're going to do is we're going to take away the dog's freedom. The dog is in the room. The dog is barking incessantly at me or you or whatever. I'm going to take the dog and I'm going to put him in his crate. Yes, his crate. No, I'm not going to tell him to go in his house if he's trained to go in there on cue. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take the dog into his crate and I'll demonstrate how to get dogs into crates. Um, I have a dog that I'll demonstrate that does not want to go into a crate. Um, and I've been saving that for this video so I can show you a really swift way to get them in there. But um, I'm sure right now you're thinking, gee, that's funny. I heard, I read, I saw on TV, on the internet, whatever. I should never, ever, ever use the crate as punishment. Okay, let's talk about what's wrong with this statement. It is not the crate that is the punishment. Anybody that understands basic psychology knows this is not about the crate. This is about you've taken away the freedom. The crate is only punishment if the dog is in there for too long or it's too uncomfortable, it's too small for him, or you've picked up the crate and you've hit him with it. That would be using the crate as punishment, not acceptable that would be using the crate as punishment. So the real punishment by putting the dog on a timeout in the crate is taking away the freedom. And you know, the parallel example of that would be with children. I mean, nobody thinks that if they send their child to their room for a timeout that, that the room is, is punishing them. No, it's that they got taken out of the environment. They got taken away from their friend or their toys or whatever it was. That is what's punishing. So I hope that makes sense to you. We want to make sure that that's clearly understood. Otherwise, people typically don't want to use the crate. There's an important factor, though. We have to make sure that that crate is also a happy place 10 times more than it's used as the timeout. So make sure you play crate games with your dog, whether that's throwing toys, maybe he's got a favorite tennis ball and you'll throw it near the crate to start and eventually you're gonna throw it in the crate so they gotta go in the crate to get it. Maybe you feed your dog in the crate because 
you know, the crate can't be that bad if it provides food. And over time, that crate becomes a very, very, very um, enjoyable place for your dog. And the association is, in his mind, good things go on with the crate. Every once in a while, yeah, I lose my freedom in the crate. So we want to make sure that they don't hate the crate. We don't want, because it's not really hating the crate, it's hating of the losing of the freedom. Using that crate as a timeout is a twofold parts in learning. One, we want them to learn. You made the wrong choice by barking incessantly. I've put you in for a timeout. The most important other half of the learning is what does the dog have to do to get rewarded with his freedom? Well, it's simple. If he's quiet and settled in the crate, you should open the door and let him out. You don't give him cookies. You don't pat him. You don't get all excited. You just quietly open the door and let him have his freedom. Now, if your dog goes right back to engaging in the very behavior that resulted in the timeout in the first place, don't have contempt for him. Embrace that opportunity. Why? Because we want him to make the mistake so that he learns from it. So don't interrupt him. Don't cut him off. If he's about to do something that he shouldn't do, don't go, ah, don't go, no, don't tell him. Don't, don't say anything. Don't say, don't do that. Don't say, be quiet, nothing. Let him do it so that he learns from it. That's how they learn what are the wrong decisions here. So he re-engages, perfect learning opportunity. He goes straight back into the timeout. He's quiet and settled, quietly open the door, let him back out. If he re-engages again, repeat it again. He's gonna figure this out. And he's also figuring out, hey, Good things happen when I'm quiet and settled. Kind of bites when I gotta get a time out. I lose my freedom. When we put them in the crate, it doesn't, it's not about how much time. It's not about the fact that they committed some massive crime, like they ate your $100,000 collectible book or something. Um, if you're really mad, then the answer to how long they go in the crate is until you're not mad anymore. But if you're in control of your emotions, you put them in the crate, the moment that you see that they're quiet and settled, let them out so they learn from that. Otherwise they're thinking, well, if I'm quiet and settled, I don't get anything for that. So let me try something else. And then they might try paddling the door, barking, ramming it, rocking it, whatever. Um, there are some dogs that are actually smart enough to rock a crate over to the stairs and um, unfortunately bouncing down the stairs opens it up. We don't want them to be doing that. We want them to understand that quiet and settled is what's going to get them out of the timeout. Okay? And you need to be aware of your dog's behavior in the crate. So I don't want you to sit there and stare at them because that is going to elicit barking. Okay? but I want you to be aware of what they're doing. So don't put them in a timeout and leave. Put them in the timeout and just be aware without staring at them. And like I said, be really quiet when you go over to let them back out because it's all about being calm. If we were playing fly ball or agility or something like that, yeah, we'd be ramping them up, really excited. But that's not what we want in our day-to-day -day family life with our pets, right? We prefer calm and quiet. We're gonna go throw a ball, they're gonna get excited. There's a time and a place for that. Um, but generally, this is what we want. So punishment, time out, time out, time out, losing of the freedom, losing of rewards. If a puppy is chewing on my fingers versus a dog that's not teething, um, putting its teeth on me, I do treat them separately, uh, differently actually. Puppies, do not let them chew on your fingers. I know that they're teething. I know everybody uses this as an excuse, but don't ever allow that to happen because remember, what they learn first, they learn best. 
We don't want them learning early on that it's okay to sink teeth into human flesh, okay? Not acceptable. They need bite inhibition. They were learning it from their litter mates up until we took them away from their litter and then that learning seems to stop. So if a puppy puts its teeth on me, I yelp, ow! I withdraw and I will give them something appropriate to chew on. A stuffed Kong is ideal. If they choose my finger over the Kong, so they go back after me versus what I've given them, then they're going in a timeout. But they're going in a timeout with the chew object. The number one reliever of stress is chewing. That's why dogs with separation anxiety, especially severe separation anxiety, destroy the house because they've chewed everything. Okay? Chewing is a stress reliever, but especially in puppies, they're teething and it's painful and they need to sink their teeth into something. So let's get them hooked on something that's appropriate to chew on and safe for them later on so that they know that teeth on human flesh is a no-no. So puppy's chewing on the Kong, nice and quiet in the crate. Again, open the crate door. Don't be surprised if they just stay in there and they don't come out. That's perfectly fine, perfectly fine. Non-puppies putting their teeth on me, I don't care how gentle it is. People say, oh, he didn't know. No, he knows, he knows. He's testing the waters. Remember that any behavior that gets reinforced, gets repeated, gets stronger. So that little bit of contact is a little bit of contact that's going to become more contact and more contact or more contact or more contact. So it's really important that you stop that as soon as it starts happening. If you have a dog that's really rude to take the treats, if you're feeding the treat like this, okay, the dog can easily grab your hand or your finger and your thumb. You might want to change it to feeding it like this to the dog. If you have children that are doing the homework exercise with the 85 rewards, um, simply just throw the treat at the dog or on the floor. That's perfectly fine. It doesn't have to be delivered from your hand. You've got a dog that's getting really grabby. We're gonna have a video later on in the curriculum that is really a very effective exercise and humane, it's very humane, of educating the dogs as to how to take a treat and you should be able to hold the treat in front of the dog's nose and the dog doesn't go, okay? They learn to wait to take it because just because they can reach it doesn't mean they should take it. We want them to understand that just because you can access something doesn't mean you should take it. You should be able to have a cheese tray on your coffee table in full reach of your dog with your company there and your dog not going up and helping himself, right? So let's always be thinking ahead to what's coming in the future, okay? Welcome back. Let's talk about a little bit more about how we're going to utilize punishment um, beyond the crate. What happens when the crate's not there? Well, that's always a problem when we're not in a normal environment. And some of the things that you can do is you can just get up and leave the room. If a dog is being inappropriate and you don't have a crate handy, you can just remove yourself from the situation. So that's how you would be negatively punishing the dog. You take yourself away from the dog. Sometimes it could just mean you're just gonna shut the door. You're gonna leave them there. You're just gonna shut the door. Other times it might mean that you're going to step on the leash and it's going to force them into a den. That's a good exercise to teach dogs because one would be that if they ever got their collar hooked on something, that they don't panic, that they don't um, twist and panic and turn, and then they could asphyxiate themselves by choking themselves out with the collar. We don't want that to happen. So that's a kind of a, a double exercise or a double learning opportunity from one exercise is we just step on the leash. When we step on the leash, um, they will uh, usually lie down. In the beginning, they might panic, but that panic is a good opportunity for them to learn not to panic. 
the reward from that will be really simple. It's not a treat, okay? It's simply that you're going to take your foot off the leash. And I use my foot because it's so much easier to hold that leash with my foot than it is my hands. We've, um, I have, I'll have a, a video about the gentle leader, but people always ask me, what is my favorite collar? Um, they also ask me about harnesses. And let me tell you about harnesses. I'm, I'm not a fan of harnesses. Now, there are some dogs that they have to be walked on a harness um, versus a collar. One of them would be Yorkshire Terriers. Orthopedic surgeons are saying that they're very prone to um, trachea collapse. And because of that, they suggest that they go on a harness. The issue I have with harnesses in general is that when it's across the chest, it actually encourages dogs to lean on it. And harnesses were built for pulling. Dogs like to counter pressure. So if they feel the pressure on their chest, they're going to lean against it and pull more. There are these other fancy harnesses like Easy Walk and things like that. I don't know. There's a bunch of them on the market. Um, and they basically kind of wrap around the shoulders. And the other problem too is that when you're hooking a harness, you're behind the shoulders. And so your dog has the point of his nose to the point of the leash that much further to lunge ahead if they need to. Um, they don't get cut off so easily by the leash restraint when they have a harness being done up on their back. But those fancy harnesses that are meant to curb the dog from pulling, they're actually causing damage to the shoulders. And I've read a lot of information and studies about that. And basically, if you think of a rope, and the rope is becoming unraveled over time. It's becoming more and more and more unraveled until one day it's just gonna give way. Think of the muscle tissue as a rope and it's being um, damaged by these types of harnesses. So that can become very problematic and not repairable for your dog. And I don't wanna see that happen. So I'm not really a fan of the harness. One thing I am a fan of though, is the gentle leader. And there's all, there's others, they're head halters. You'll see some, you know, the halty and some other types. Um, this particular one is the gentle leader brand. I like the gentle leader brand because it has the locking mechanism to go underneath. I can't recommend this enough. This makes walking so easy and so enjoyable. And it's a much kinder method of using um, uh, way of tethering your dog, but don't ever use it with a flexi lead or a very, very long lead. Um, gentle leaders are available in most of the stores, and you can also order them online. I'm a fan of it because of the locking mechanism underneath. They're very well made, and uh, that stops the gentle leader from coming off of the face easily. It's important that you introduce it properly, and so I recommend that you read the booklet that is included with the gentle leader, but I will also make a short video um, that you can follow along to condition your dog to accept the gentle leader. Whatever you do, don't put it on your dog and try to go for a walk. Your dog will hate it. They will crocodile roll and they'll do nothing but just try to get the um, head halter off of their face. So it takes some time and you start with putting the loop on their nose and feeding them treats and gradually doing it up and making it enjoyable and associate good things with it. But the booklet describes it very well, but we'll also make a video for it. So we understand punishment. We understand how we can use freedom as a reward so that it's not always cookies because freedom is a pretty big reward, right? We can use freedom a lot in our recalls and an exercise that I want you to do a lot is if you are lucky enough to have a fenced backyard and your dog is out there loose, I want you to make sure that the recall is really good because if you just call the dog and they choose not to come, and please don't do this, cookies, and bribe them. Please, please, please don't do that. What you need to do is when you're out with your dog and your dog is loose in the yard or you're at say the Leash Free Park and your dog is loose, I don't want you to only ever call your dog when you're leaving because 
what is it that you're teaching your dog by doing that? If your dog is running around and he's playing with his friends and he's fetching sticks and sniffing everything and digging holes, whatever he's doing, he's enjoying his freedom, right? He's really enjoying his freedom. And then you kind of look at the time and you're like, oh, I gotta go. So I call him, woohoo, puppy, come on. And he comes running to you and he gives you this great recall. I mean, he comes in like a torpedo, he even sits really nicely and you put the leash on and you leave. What are you teaching your dog? You've just punished him. You've negatively punished him for coming to you. I know you didn't mean to, but that's how recalls get destroyed. The behavior will start to diminish and then it will get to the point where when he hears the word come, he's gonna book it and go the other way because he doesn't want to leave. So when you have your dog loose and you're playing with him outside in the yard or whatever, practice calling him to you and make it enjoyable for him. So you could call him to you, grab his collar, give him a treat. As long as he's not pulling on that collar for one second, let him go and reward him for being relaxed. Set him back free, give him his freedom. Let him engage with whatever he's doing. Call him once. If he doesn't come, you're gonna go get him. Call him, he comes to you. Maybe you play tug of war with him or something. Hold the collar, as long as he's not pulling, set him free. And then he learns that this association, hey, when my mom or dad call me, always good things happen. And when it is time, I'm, saying, I'm not saying that you can't ever bring him in or you can't ever leave a leash-free park, but what I'm saying is that 10 times more than not, calling him to you isn't going to end that enjoyment for him. When you are ready to leave and you are going to put that leash on him, make sure you're rewarding him in some other way. Maybe you're running. Don't run while you're in the leash free park. Get out of the park and maybe you're going to run up to the parking lot to your car. That's rewarding. Maybe you're going to give him treats, lots of treats even, for coming to you and being leashed and removing him from the park. You want to make sure that the end is not what sticks in their head in some other way. Maybe you're running, don't run while you're in the leash free park. Get out of the park and maybe you're gonna run up to the parking lot to your car, that's rewarding. Maybe you're going to give him treats, lots of treats even, for coming to you and being leashed and removing him from the park. You want to make sure that the end is not what sticks in their head, okay? Really important. That's how we ruin behaviors that we like, that we want to be repeated. Um, when we nag our dogs and we just repeat commands over and over and over again, all that they're learning is that it buys them time. They get rewarded for ignoring you. So don't reward them for ignoring you. If I call my dog and my dog doesn't come the first time I call, I'm going to get him. And dogs that play keep away, oh, that's like my biggest pet peeve. I can't stand it. If a dog is running, if you chase them, you are so heavily reinforcing this terrible behavior. And that becomes even harder to get rid of because it's so rewarding for the dog. So make sure that you don't do that. Um, I go and I get my dog. If my dog is not listening, I'm going to get a long line. It could be a, a nice thick piece of rope that's 20 feet long because I know that I can't catch my dog. I'm not that fast, but I know that I can get within 20 feet and I can step on that rope. Um, some people, they use what's called a lunge line for horses. That works great too. You, uh, locally, you can get it at, at Brewbaker's or Greenhawk or Pleasant Ridge. And um, don't get the one with the chain, just get the one with the clip and then the long rope on top of that. You can even double it so that you'd have 40 feet um, which is even better, but that way you can make sure you reinforce your demand for the recall. You call your dog, they don't come, you step on that rope and you're gonna reel them in. And then you can send them out, but maybe stop them at three feet and then 10 feet and then 15 feet and then five feet and change it up so that they never really know where it's going to end. And that's also gonna help with the pulling 
It's also going to make them more aware of you. Also, the puppy people. Never start your puppy outside walking without the leash because when they realize that they can go and explore things on their own before the recall is solidified, you're going to have a really hard time with that. Because remember the video game versus the jigsaw puzzle? Out on a walk, you're the jigsaw puzzle and the rest of the world is the video game. You don't want to be in that situation. You want to condition your puppy's mind. You want to program them to realize that they can't escape you. And then you can start going out on a longer line. And if your puppy gets far ahead of you, just duck in behind a tree and hide and make it so that your puppy has to find you. Make it so that your dog gets in the habit of looking where you are rather than you always having to worry about where your dog is. And that's a great habit to start from the beginning. But we don't want them to learn that they can just take off and not listen to us. Because again, remember what they learn first, they learn best. So let's have them first learn that they can't just take off and that the recall is very rewarding and it is very, very strong. So that you'll get to that point one day where maybe a deer comes running across the trail and your dog will stop in its tracks and will listen to you. That's the ultimate goal. It has to be important. So always be thinking, here's the best way for problem solving, okay? This is so important. Any behavior that is a behavior that you don't like, okay? So this is the toolbox. This is how you can fix anything. Any behavior that you don't like that is being repeated is being repeated because, why? Because somehow the dog is being rewarded. The behavior is being reinforced somehow. The answer lies within you. You have to look at the behavior and then look at yourself and you have to ask yourself, what am I doing that's positively reinforcing the very behavior that I don't want? Well, what are you adding? Remember add, positive? positive reinforcement. You're adding something to that behavior that you don't want. That's the only reason why it gets repeated. The only reason, okay? Yes, there are some self-rewarding behaviors. Don't get me wrong. We'll, we'll talk, we'll have a session just about that. But for the most part, it falls on you. You are rewarding behaviors that you don't want. So take a look at yourself of what you're doing. Are you telling them to be quiet? Are you making eye contact? Are you, are you, contact? Are you making physical contact with them? What is it that you're doing that the dog is finding rewarding and is repeating these behaviors that you don't want? When you realize what that is, you stop doing it. That is when the behavior will change. Now, if there's behaviors that you had that were really good, and they're not so good anymore, same thing. What is it that you are doing that is inadvertently punishing that behavior? Well, we just talked about the recall um, when your dog is loose, right? We don't want it to mean that it is always going to end a behavior. So that's a good way to ruin a recall is by ending their freedom. So remember, 10 times is freedom regained, one time is, yeah, we're leaving, but it's rewarding to leave. Also, is there behaviors that you want and you're not seeing them being repeated? You want these behaviors to be repeated. You want them to get stronger, but you're not getting them. Well, because you're not rewarding them. It's that simple. If <coughs> my dog is lying down and is quiet and settled and I ignore him when he's quiet and settled, why should he repeat it? He gets far more attention by being rude and obnoxious than he is by being quiet and settled. So that's what you've got to change up. I want you to be thinking more and more about how you interact with your dog. What messages are you giving your dog? What is it that you're teaching your dog? Why is your dog behaving this way? Everything that your dog is doing, he's learned from interacting with you. He wasn't born like that. He had no idea what anything meant. He's learned everything from his day-to-day -day life with you. So make it count. 
everything that you do is educating your dog. And because if you're lucky, you're going to have this dog for 16 years, maybe even more. We want that to be a good, long, happy relationship. So look at it a little bit more carefully. So I want to leave on this final note. You're going to wonder what does this have to do with dog training and you'll figure that out in a minute let's say i'm speeding and i'm going down highway 401 and i go past this particular exit and the opp is there the provincial police and i'm caught i'm speeding they catch me one let's take a look at speeding the behavior of speeding why would I do it? Well, it would be self-rewarding, right? It's the driver's perception that they may, maybe they get from point A to point B faster. Maybe it's a fun car to drive and it's self-rewarding to have the thrill of driving this car faster. Whatever it is, speeding is a choice. And, right, it's important to realize it's a choice. Is it a good choice or a bad choice? Well, I guess it's bad when you get caught. So, what happens? Well, you get pulled over. There's several consequences that could happen that are likely to happen. So one would be that you have the consequence of losing some time because the time it takes to be pulled over and go through that whole process, it costs you time, right? Next would be the ticket. And in Ontario, Canada, that ticket can be pretty hefty. So there's the financial consequence of the ticket. A later consequence could be insurance goes up because if the insurance company finds out that you're speeding, they're probably gonna hike your rate. We have a lot of consequences for a bad choice. Well, how does that affect the driver's behavior? Let's think about that. Does getting caught and getting the ticket and losing time and money, does that mean that the driver never speeds again? Of course not. I don't know anybody that stopped speeding because they got a ticket. But it did change behavior. It did change it. But the punishment didn't actually change what it was punishing for. How does the behavior change? Well, maybe when you're driving down the 401 at that same exit, you're looking for the police, right? You're, you're aware, oh, well, he was here last time. Maybe he's here this time and you're looking for him. You're looking for him. How else does it change your behavior? Well, when you see him, you probably look at your speedometer and you touch your brake. As soon as you feel safe again, you're going to go back to speeding, right? Let's be honest. There's bad choices going on there that have consequences. And what does this have to do with dog training? Pretty simple. Let's say, for example, your dog is in the kitchen and you have a pound of butter sitting on the counter. And let's say it's a great day and it can easily reach the pound of butter on the counter or it's one of those really super smart beagles and it moves a chair over this actually happens to the counter and it gets up on the chair and on the counter it eats the whole pound of butter that we call counter surfing that is a very strong self-rewarding behavior why is it self-rewarding because the dog rewards itself he finds a way to get on the counter and he consumes the butter which is the reward he's going to do it again and again and again especially if it's very rewarding by the way, they'll never make the connection between getting diarrhea and counter surfing. That just won't happen. So the dog makes the choice to get on the counter and eat the butter and he gets rewarded for it. You make the choice to speed and you get from point A to point B, your perception is it's faster and it's self rewarding. It's, it's pretty much the same idea, right? Well, what happens when the dog gets caught? Hmm. So he gets caught and he gets punished. Does that mean he never, ever, ever tries to take the butter off the counter again? No, it doesn't mean that at all. How does it change the dog's behavior? 
the same way it changes the driver who was speeding. Before the dog just came in, could smell that there was food, it was attractive, and he just went for it, right? So before you knew the OPP were sitting there, you just went for it. But now you've been caught. So the dog's behavior changes. He realizes what? He realizes that it's not safe to take the butter when you're there. It's not safe to speed down the 401 when the OPP are there. The same. Well, what do we do? One, please manage your home properly, especially with puppies. Don't have your shoes that are accessible to the puppy to chew on them because I guarantee he will chew one of every pair you own. Do not have access to waste containers, especially diaper pails, dirty laundry. Dogs love chewing all that stuff. And the last I heard, it's um, over $2,000 to surgically remove some dirty socks from their tummy. Let's not put them through that. Let's not let them get in the habit. Let's not let them get attracted to these things first. Let's manage our homes as best we can, especially in puppies. Okay, especially in puppies. But anyhow, going back to what we were talking about. The pound of butter is there, the dog has been caught, and now the dog learns, oh, nobody's here, it's safe to go get the butter. Oh, no, she's home. I'm not looking at the butter, I wasn't doing anything. And goes back to being innocent. But the moment that the opportunity is right, the speeding or the butter eating happens. That happens in house training. If you scold your dog for eliminating on your carpet, your dog will only learn that it's not safe to do that when you're there. And then they will find the safe place to do that. They will go behind furniture or typically if they have access to the basement, that's always the number one choice. They're going to go where there's the least amount of people in traffic, okay, to avoid getting caught. Well, what happens in this situation? Now, thankfully, we live in a place that this is not likely to happen, but we have to be real and realize that this can happen in other places, but it could happen. So let's say that the speeder is speeding and gets caught and gets more than a ticket, gets abused, really terribly. Now let's face it, some people are really sensitive and it doesn't take a lot to cause them psychological trauma. Um, but that aside, let's say this becomes a very traumatic experience for the person. How does that affect the behavior about speeding? It has nothing to do with speeding. It could cause the driver to be so traumatized that they never drive again. It could cause the driver to fear all men if it was a male police officer. It could cause the driver to fear all people in a uniform. Or let's say the, the male officer had a beard. And so maybe that's enough for the driver to be triggered and have that fear response, seeing a man with a beard. It will cause something to go on in the brain that there will be something that will end up painting it all with the same brush. That's not what we want. We don't want to traumatize our pets. We don't want them to make that type of association. So it's not appropriate to do anything to your dog that is traumatic, okay? Because it will not fix the speeding. It'll have nothing to do with the speeding. It will have lifelong consequences that are really hard to undo. Let's take another scenario. Let's say you're going down the 401 and you're doing exactly the speed limit, which would be 100 kilometers an hour. There's a police officer. He sees you. He sees you doing exactly 100. He pulls you over and he comes up and he says, here's a check for $10,000. I am rewarding you for making the right choice to follow the speed limit. And he rewards you for that choice. 
well, how does that affect your behavior? Well, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking I'm quitting my job. I'm driving up and down the 401 every day, all day, looking, looking for the police officer and looking for that opportunity to show that I'm making the right choice. I'd be like, Mr. Police Officer, look at me, look at me, I'm doing a hundred. Well, how does that work? Gee, it results in the desired behavior, the motivation to repeat the behavior, and a good association with those involved. That's what I want for your dogs. I want them to behave in a way where they're looking to you because they're making good choices and they're looking to you like, hey, look at me, I'm doing really good. I'm sitting, I'm lying down, I'm quiet, I'm settled, I'm walking nicely on a leash. Look at me, I am making good choices. That's what we want for you and your dog. That's the goal in this program. We're gonna help you get there. Thanks everybody. Get those dogs conditioned to the reward marker and we'll see you next time where we're gonna work on the basic obedience commands of sit, down, stand, recall, walking on a leash, not jumping up on people, potty training, all of these things. We're gonna get there together. Have a great day. Go love your dog. Come on, baby.